All right, so this is um, lecture five of uh, Josephus, historian, hero, hero and traitor, part of a series by Rabbi Lawrence Troster. Uh, this is um, January 7th. So uh, two things that I wanted to bring out that came up last time. Uh, first of all, um, when we were looking at the account of the Essenes and how they were so strict on practicing Shabbat, that they didn't um, defecate on Shabbat um, because it involved digging a hole and they wouldn't do that. And that each of them, when uh, the, no the novitiate, became, the novice became part of the community, they were issued a hatchet or a shovel or something for that purpose. Now, I alluded to the fact it was based on something in Deuteronomy and I went back and checked and it's even closer than I thought in terms of what they did. In other words, they were actually following uh, something in Deuteronomy, but, but making it even st a, a, a practice that I don't think at all was a widespread one. Um, so if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 23 um, in your Tanakhs, um, verse 13, and it's on page 424 in the bilingual uh, JPS Tanakh, um, this is part of, uh, you know, it's part of the law code of Parshat Ki Tetze. And then in verse 10, it talks of, uh, there's already been a section on the laws of war, but now there is um, a little bit more uh, about the laws of war. Um, interestingly enough, of purity laws, which you don't find in Deuteronomy very much. But the first law is about um, people in the army who have a nocturnal emission um, and what they have to do. Um, and then in verse 13 it says, Further there shall be an area for you outside the camp where you may relieve yourself. That's what I was alluding to, the idea that you had to establish a latrine outside the military camp because the military camp had a holy status to it. In other words, it was a, it was a sacred army, so to speak. But then notice what it says, With your gear you shall have a spike. And when you have squatted, you will dig a hole with it and cover up your excrement, since the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and deliver you to your enemies. Let your camp be holy. Let him not find anything unseemly among you and turn away from you. So here, according to Josephus, the Essenes are, uh, see themselves as a holy military um, uh, group and that their habitations are like a sacred military camp. So they are following the rule of Deuteronomy as if they are part of that thing. Now, there's no evidence that I know of that anybody else did this, okay? Um, because they were incredibly scrupulous about this, according to Josephus. And it wouldn't surprise me because, um, you know, given again perhaps the priestly connection with with them and what we know from the Qumran literature, they were very scrupulous about uh, more than others about purity laws and it was often the interpretation of the purity laws that created these sectarian groups. In other words, what were the issues that divided them, various groups of Jews? The purity laws were one of them. How? Because when you look at the huge corpus of purity laws in the Torah, especially in the book of Leviticus, Despite the large number of the laws, it's not always so clear-cut exactly how to follow all of them. And so the details of that were often what divided Jewish groups. That was one of the key elements that um, were the divisions between, especially between the sectarian groups. And that was true, by the way, of the Pharisees in terms of their uh, laws in relations to others. So, so th th this is why I wanted to bring this up, because I thought it was uh, important to clarify that they were, in fact, basing themselves exactly upon a law in Deuteronomy. Did somebody have a question? Cal, you look like you... No? Okay. Yeah, yeah Mike? How, how would Josephus have known about all the different sets? How would he... I mean, well, he was... Uh, would understand, and maybe... No, no, but he... That's the point. According to his life, uh, his autobiography, he had uh, tried them all out, and he... he I mean, he doesn't call himself a Sadducee, but I mean, he grew up with when what we would probably consider the Sadducean circles, uh, which were, you know, primarily priestly 
Um, he, and I'll talk about this in a minute, he claims that he ended up as a Pharisee, but, um, you know, we'll, um, but the fact is, he, according to his autobiography, he spent time with an Essene spiritual master and became a novice, but he didn't, he left. He didn't become, maybe he didn't take the final step. Yes, Harvey, you had a uh, comment. Just from a practical point of view, you put X number of men in a planned area. You've got a very sanitary Yes, uh, there's no doubt about that. The connection between um, uh, sanitary, what we would call sanitary laws and uh, purity laws are pretty evident um, in uh, the Torah's purity laws. There's no doubt about it. Um, the question is what is considered a form of impurity in the Torah is different from what we consider to be because we base ours on a virus and microbial concept of disease, there is a very different idea of what is um, unhealthy, um, the source of that unhealthiness that in the Torah as opposed to the way we have defined it because of modern medicine. But naturally, I mean, all societies to a certain extent have uh, cleanliness and sanitary laws on all kinds of different levels. I mean, think of, uh, think of the uh, Japanese ideas of cleanliness and how they're very different from ours. Uh, you know, and, and it comes from a different basis uh, of understanding of what constitutes clean and what constitutes dirty, which are cultural <laughs> concept to a great extent. Rabbi, you have to expand on how the Japanese differ from us. Well, um, you know, they, they actually have a, a tradition with Japanese have a much higher level of what we would call hygienic uh, uh, understanding than we do. The fact that they uh, demand that you t that they have a sharp separation between what you wear on your feet on the street as opposed to in the house, okay? Which is actually a very old idea. It's the reason why um, the priests in the temple didn't wear shoes because when you're walking outside, you're, you could be walking in all kinds of things, right? Um, so th th there, th there's a different concepts of hygiene, which are not all what we would call science-based, but are often culturally constructed. No, they, all of them are empiricism. They didn't know why. They just knew that certain things led to disease and certain things didn't. But I think it becomes almost ritual. What I'm saying is it becomes ritualized to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. That was the problem, the digging of the hole in Shabbat? Yes, digging a them, hole because it's... them in advance? No, well, <laughs> you know, if you were an Essene novice, you could ask your Rebbe, Rebbe, why don't we dig the holes in advance? You know, I mean, I have no idea. I have no idea the answer to that question. Covering it up. Covering it up, right, yeah. exactly. Okay, the other thing I want to point out um, is that... Um, when uh, Josephus calls himself a Pharisee in his autobiography, that's the only time ever in his entire literature that he says that. Nowhere in his earlier writings is ever indicated that he is a Pharisee. All right, and so the question is, why does he do that at the end of his life? And some scholars feel, because that was when the Pharisees who had survived, the only real group that had uh, survived, the, uh, the destruction were beginning to assert leadership of the Jewish community. And even though he's sitting in Rome, you know, this is the beginning of what we might call the takeover by the rabbis of Judaism. That's what some people believe. Um, that, in fact, if you look for in the wars, which are his first writing, um, the Pharisees are also uh, differently uh, portrayed than they are in the antiquities. In other words, there's a process by which the Pharisees in his writing um, become, um, get a, a better press, you might say, as his, in the later of his writings, which some people reflect that rabbinic, uh, what we would call the beginning of the rabbinic takeover of Judaism. The, the problem is, is that the rabbinic takeover of Judaism took several hundred years. I mean, that, one of the things the scholars are still arguing about is exactly when can we say that Judaism is rabbinic Judaism. And it's, you know, the old story was it happened fairly soon, you know, by the year 90 or in the second century. Now people believe it actually took long, much longer than that. So what was going on? It's... Well, there were Jews. I mean, there were just Jews. And the idea was is that the rabbinic group, in fact, in the second century, this is, you know, even af after the Bar Kokhba revolt, was a rather elite group of scholars, their families, and supporters. 
a very small group. They were not the leaders of the community. It was only at the end of the second century when uh, a, descent of, a descendant of the House of Hillel became the patriarch and was recognized officially by the Roman government do you begin to see uh, that kind of rabbinic authority, but essentially only over the Jews of Eretz Yisrael. I think when um, the Jews of Babylon, who are not rabbinic, get converted to rabbinic Judaism in the third century, then you're really beginning to see it. But the first time you can actually have evidence of a rabbinic synagogue in Eretz Yisrael, because the rabbis themselves tended, <clears throat> the evidence is they, they tended to stay not in, they didn't control the synagogue. The synagogues were controlled by lay leadership and was very local. Um, they were in the Beit Midrash, the house of study. That was their venue. Um, there's a, I think it's from the fourth century, there's a the ruins of a synagogue in Eretz Yisrael from the Galilee, which actually has you know, the name of a rabbi in it, you know. Uh, so that's like the earliest that we have definitive archaeological evidence of a rabbinic synagogue. So it, it's a long process. Uh, so th those are two things I wanted to start with. Okay, so um, I want to look at the, the, the fourth um, detailed description of the, of the we, we started, we sort of ended with that uh, last week on page 572, this is the Antiquities, Book 18, uh, Chapter 1, um, Paragraph 2. Um, so again, this is the Antiquities, Book 18, Chapter 1, Paragraph 2, um, uh, Line 11. Um, he has just talked about um, uh, what he called the fourth philosophical sect uh, of the r uh, rebellion, and we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, and so he, in, in, in uh, paragraph two, he uh, talks about, uh, he again says there's the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and he says, I've already spoken about them, but I'm going to touch them. So now here, he gives a much bigger description of the Pharisees than he had previously. So in the Wars, which is the earliest description, um, that's that's number uh, two on our list here that I've given you, uh, he focuses on the Essenes. Now, this is 10, 15 years later, which list, uh, on, on the lecture three, the Jewish World Part II, uh, under the detailed description II, the, you know, um, uh, A2, um, he, where he's talking about from the time of uh, 6 CE, he focuses on the Essenes. That was the long passage we looked at last time. Um, in, um, uh, in the first one, it's very brief from, from the Antiquities. This one, he's going to give us a little more about the Pharisees, and he's going to give a shorter version of the Essenes than he did in the Wars. Um, and he also gives a little bit more of the Sadducees than he did before. So let's take a look at it. Uh, again, this is Book 18, Chapter 1, Paragraph 3, Line uh, 12, on page 572 in the edition that most of us have, uh, where it says, Now for the Pharisees. Uh, Sam, do you have that? I've got, I've got uh, Book 18, Chapter, chapter, one. chapter, chapter 2. One. Oh, chapter 1. Yeah, one. yeah, Chapter 1. Paragraph 2. Paragraph two. Okay. Sorry, three. 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 Starting at three. Yeah. Okay. Now for the Pharisees. I got it. <clears throat> now for the Pharisees. They live meanly and despise delicacies in diet, and they follow the conduct of reason and what that prescribes to them as good for them, they do. And they think they ought earnestly to strive to observe reason's dictates for practice. They also pay a respect to such as are in years, nor are they so bold as to contradict them in anything which they have introduced. And when they determine that all things are done by fate, they do not take away the freedom from men of acting as they think fit, since their notion is that it hath pleased God to make a temperament, whereby what he wills is done, but so that the will of men can act virtuous virtuously or viciously. All right, we'll, we'll stop there for a second. Um, it, it's very interesting. Um, you know, they, they tend to live simply. They're not extravagant. Um, notice it says, 
Strive to observe reason's dictates for practice. The Pharisees have this, you know, reputation of uh, knowing how to interpret the law of the Torah, the laws of the Torah. And notice that they give deference to seniority. Okay, and the idea is that they balance the notion of determinism with free will as opposed to the Essenes, who are strict determinists. And as you will see, as opposed to the Sadducees, again, he's talking to a non-Jewish audience, he's putting it in terms of uh, Greek, kind of Greek philosophical schools, <clears throat> of which there were similar kinds of uh, ideas among certain schools, that everything <laughs> is essentially determined or by fate. Um, again, fate in Josephus is not the same as fate in Greek thinking. Um, all right, read on. They also believe... <clears throat> they also believe that souls have an immortal vigor in them and that under the earth there will be rewards or punishments according as they have lived virtuously or viciously in, the, in this life. And the latter are to be detained in an everlasting prison, but that the former shall have power to revive and live again. So they believe in the survival of the soul, punishment by or, or and reward after death in heaven or hell and resurrection of the dead. Of the good. Of the, all, yes, only of the good people. That's the interesting thing because in the book of Daniel, where the, which is, you know, dates from the second century BCE, where the concept of resurrection is first mentioned, it's everybody gets resurrected uh, and then the wicked are judged after the resurrection. Here, mm -hmm. it seems only the good people get resurrected. Now, the resurrection, by the way, is a very problematic idea in, in the ancient world, um, precisely because it would appear uh, to contradict the laws of nature. So whereas the Greeks sort of created the notion of the survival of a soul, the idea which they didn't think did contradict the laws of nature, the idea that a body once dissipated after death could come back together again is unnatural. So this was something that uh, was a Jewish idea that had to be strongly defended. Um, later on in the Middle Ages, it it was, uh, a, a, and the reason was is because the Greeks didn't believe that something could come from nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean that 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 the natural law prohibited the idea of something coming from nothing. So. Um, the Jews had not yet promulgated the notion of creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing, which, by the way, was primarily promulgated as a way to counteract this problem of resurrection. If you believe that God can create something from nothing, then God can create a new body or resurrect you. But that, we're long, you know, that, that's down hundreds of years in the future. Um, uh, okay? But it, it is a problem for people in Greek, raised in Greek uh, uh, ideas of science and culture, that the resurrection is a really problematic idea. Go on. It seems not to be a problem today for, for the ultra-Orthodox. No, but for most Jews it is, because it, like the ancient times, it contradicts the natural law. It was actually a problem for Maimonides. Mm -hmm. All right? He had to accept it as a matter of faith, although there are some scholars who believe he actually didn't believe in it, but as someone who accepted the scientific worldview of his time, it was contrafactual to what he believed. Mm -hmm. So he downplayed it. But what, uh, what about the Orthodox who, who you know, get, ship the body to Israel so they can be buried in well, Israel? Well, they're literalists. Facing... They're literalists. I mean, but I don't think you will find most Jews uh, believe in it. And even those of us who belong to conservative synagogues where we still have it in our liturgy, see it as something metaphorical or symbolic rather than literal. Okay. Okay. Uh, read on, on account of which doctrines? On account of which doctrines they are able greatly to persuade the body of the people, and whatsoever they do about divine worship, prayers, and sacrifices, <clears throat> they perform them according to their direction, insomuch that the cities have great attestations to them on account of their entire virtuous conduct, both in the actions of their lives and their discourses also. Now there's some interesting points here. This is that their ideas are very popular, and as a result, and notice what it is, divine worship, that's temple worship, right? Prayers and sacrifices. And it's precisely, this is one of the areas in which there is conflict that creates the sectarian conflict. 
How do you do the sacrifices correctly? What are the correct prayers? How is the temple to be worshipped? Um, as my teacher in this Shia Cohen once pointed out, the temple is a source of unity and disunity. It is the most important place in the Jewish world. It draws Jews from everywhere, but it is also how it is supposed to be run is a, and who's in charge, that's really important, is a tremendous source of disunity. And as I mentioned before, it was probably the, uh, because the, the Hasmonean Jonathan uh, became the high priest, that that may have been what the impetus to create the sectarianism of uh, the Essenes and the Pharisees um, and certainly the Qumran community, that he was illegitimate to be high priest. And by the time of the end of the first, Second Temple, the office had completely been politicized, and the appointment of the high priest was up to the Roman government. So it was a political office, so it had lost a lot of its sanctity. So this is precisely the areas where if the Pharisees are the ones who are able to persuade people, and again, the Pharisee, it's not like every Jew is a Pharisee. The Pharisees were an elite group, a relatively small group within the greater Jewish community. Okay, so, um, so there we go. And notice it says cities. The, the evidence seems to be that the Pharisees were not a rural group. They tended to be in the larger uh, centers. All right, Mike, do you want to read number four, the doctrine of the Sadducees? But the doctrine of the Sadducees is this that souls die with the bodies, nor do they regard the observation of anything besides what the law enjoins them. For they think it an instance of virtue to dispute with those, te with those teachers of philosophy whom they frequent. But this doctrine is received but by a few, yet by those still of, of the greatest dignity, but they are able to do almost nothing of themselves, for when they become magistrates, as they are unwillingly and by force sometimes obliged to be, <laughs> these are long sentences, they addict themselves to the notion of the Pharisees because the multitude would not otherwise bear them. Okay, so what's interesting is the Sadducees are very much what we might call uh, biblical uh, literalists. They don't see anything about survival of the soul uh, in the Tanakh uh, or whatever holy books they held dear, certainly not in the Torah. So they said, well, then we don't believe it. Um, and um, they says they dis have disputes. Uh, it's only they have a very, they're a very small group. Um, they have, and notice, they have to subordinate themselves to the Pharisees uh, over any kind of public disputes. Uh, so Josephus' picture of the Pharisees at this point is that they're the ones in the councils of the whatever uh, are the ones whose opinion always matters. Was this true or was he sucking up to the Pharisees when he wrote the Antiquities? Hmm or the descendants of the Pharisees, who we call the rabbis. He's in Rome. I have no idea. I mean, this is a, a very, uh, this is a difficult question, whether his picture of the power of the Pharisees at the time he is portraying them is accurate. And that time was, once again? He's, he's talking about 6 <clears throat> CE, 20 years before he was born, right? He's writing this around the year 90. So this is like 85 years later. The picture he's portraying, and, and this is after the destruction of the temple, when the, you know, the Sadducees essentially, they didn't completely die out, but they were, they, you know, they, by losing the temple, since they were primarily priestly, they didn't have heck of a lot they could do, and the Essenes were wiped out by the war. Okay? Now, we'll take a look now at the Essenes, and we're not going to go through it because we did so much, but notice um, uh, in line 19, when they send what they have dedicated to God to the temple, they do not offer sacrifices because they have more pure lustrations of their own, on which account they are excluded from the common court of the temple, but offer sacrifices themselves. What line are you on? I'm on line uh, 19. Yet is the course of their life better than that of other men. He's claiming that the Essenes are so divided from the rest of the community, they're not even allowed into the rest of the, uh, where most Jews go in the temple. They have their own part of the temple. In fact, in a text we're not going to look at, um, there is, a, there is a, a, a gate to the temple compound called the Gate of the Essenes when he's describing the temple. So they have their own separate area. They offer their own separate sacrifices, which means they, you know, there are priests among them. 
Um, and so they are completely divided by their, uh, the, again, the, how you do that. They were obviously really in disagreement with the temple hierarchy. And, and by the way, he's, he's probably, this is probably, he's probably describing something accurate. And, um, you know, he, he summarizes uh, a lot of what we um, left before, so we don't have to read um, the rest of it. Um, okay? Uh, so we've now looked at the general descriptions of the sects. What I, uh, what I've, what I gave you on that paper are, um, uh, I think there, with a couple of minor um, exceptions, these are all the references to the three sects in his writings. I mean, I, I went through it. Um, and there is, um, I only want to touch upon a few of them. We, we can't look at any of them. But I, I also listed when they were supposed to have taken place. So what's interesting is, is if you remember, um, in the time, the earliest mention of them is, according to the chronology of Josephus, is from the mid-140s BCE under uh, Jonathan the high priest, who is the brother of uh, Judah the Maccabean, is the, uh, the, the one who took over after Judah's death. And then, a little later on... Um, so you, you're, on you're on the page from lecture three. Yes, yes. You're on the front of it. Yes, now... And your other references to the... Yes, history. other reference to the Pharisees. To the Pharisees. Yes. So, um, in the time of John Hyrcanus, who... This is the way it goes. Jonathan, um, the high priest, gets uh, murdered. His brother Simon uh, takes over. And Simon establishes the Hasmonean dynasty. So his son is John Hyrcanus. Now, so around 134 BCE, uh, during the time of John Hyrcanus, the Pharisees are shown to be um, a group by, uh, for which Her John Hyrcanus first uh, supports, but then comes in conflict with. And this is worth taking a look at. So if you go to the Antiquities Book 13, Chapter 10, um, Paragraph 10, sorry, uh, 13, 10, Paragraph 5, um, which is found on page 426 in this, you will see um, that um, here he discusses his co the John Hyrcanus's conflict with the Pharisees. Again, that's the Antiquities Book 13, uh, Chapter 10, um, Paragraph 5, which is line uh, 288. Um, Mike, you want to read a little more? However, this prosperous state of affairs. It's on page 426 for those who have the, uh, the edition that most of us have. However, this prosperous state of affairs moved the Jews to envy Hercules, but, uh, but they that were the worst disposed, disposed to him were the Pharisees, who are one of the sects of the Jews, as we have informed you already. These have so great a power over the multitude that when they say anything against the king or against the high priest, they are presently believed. Again, he's claiming great power for political power for the Pharisees. They come off as a political group. Go on. Mm -hmm. Now, Her um, Hyrcanus was a disciple of theirs and greatly beloved by them. And when he once invited them to a feast and entertained them very kindly, when he saw them in a good humor, he began to say to them that they knew he was desirous to be a righteous man and to do all things whereby he might please God, which was the profession of the Pharisees also. However, he desired that, that if they observed him offending in, in any point and going out of, of the right way, they would call him back and correct him, on which occasion they attested uh, to his being entirely virtuous, with which commendation he was well pleased, but still there was one of his guests there, his name was Eli El Elazar. Elazar a man of an ill temper and delighting in seditious practices. This man said, Since thou desires to know the truth, if you will be righteous and earnest, lay down the, the high priesthood and content yourself with the civil government of the people. Now the assumption is Elazar was a Pharisee, mm -hmm. and he's saying him, 
you're ruling us as the secular leader, which Simon had sort of put the stamp on, um, and you see this in the, the end of the first book of Maccabees, I believe. Um, don't, don't be the high priest. Now remember, the Hasmoneans were a priestly family, but not of the high priestly line. They were a, a secondary line. There were different groups of priests from uh, di uh, different uh, clans of them, and only one group were supposed to be the high priests, the descendants of Tzadok, the high priest under the time of Solomon. And the last of the Zadokite line had been chased out decades before in the conflict preceding the Maccabean Revolt. Okay? And, uh, and so the line of Tzadok, there must have been other descendants, but nonetheless... So Herkin, uh, John Hyrcanus bec has become high priest. So Eleazar says, you know, you really, if you really want to follow what we want to do, stop being high priest. And now he's going to give the reason. He's not giving, you're not of the line of Tzadok. He's giving some other reason, which is incredibly insulting. Go on. And when he desired to know for what cause he ought to lay down the high priesthood, the other replied, we have heard it from old men that your mother had been cat." had been a captive under the reign of Antiochus... Epiphanes, Antiochus the Fourth. Uh, okay. <clears throat> this story was false, and Hyrcanus was provoked against him. And all the Pharisees had a, great, had a very great indignation against him. So, um, he, he's implying that there's an illegitimacy to John Hyrcanus, because if his mother was a captive, she, could, she was, would have been raped. Mm-hmm. And therefore, he would exclude him from being, he would be what we would call a mamzer. Mm -hmm. Technically, no, not in the Yiddish sense, but in the, in the Hebrew technical sense of being an illegitimate child. Right? A child born of, remember, a mamzer technically is a child born of adultery or incest. In this case, if his mother was raped because she was a captive of 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 uh, Antiochus IV, that would account technically as an adulterous uh, thing, and therefore he had he was illegitimate. If he was, in other words, it wasn't guaranteed that his father wasn't his father. But if his mother was raped, then she's no longer she, she shouldn't have been married to. Well, there's two reasons she should no longer be married to uh, a Kohen, and secondly, the possibility was is that he in fact was the child. Uh, was not his father's child. So Eleazar, who maybe seems to be a Pharisee, but not 100%, is, is this nudnik who's raising this conflict, okay? And if we were to um, go a little further, um, it talks about how there's another guy named Jonathan who is a Sadducee, and um, he is sort of starts provoking Hyrcanus against the Pharisees, okay? And the way he, the Sadducee is provoking against the Pharisees is, he says, this man should be punished. What do the Pharisees think he should have? And the Pharisees say he should be beaten, he should be whipped. But Hyrcanus thinks that they should put the guy to death, okay? So in what follows is there then becomes a conflict between Jonathan, uh, between Hyrcanus who now follows the Sadducees versus the Pharisees. What so, turns him to follow the Sadducees? What? What turns him to follow the Sadducees? The fact that the Pharisees will not punish this member of theirs okay. by putting him to death for raising this slander. Because according oh. to jo Josephus, this, in fact, this story about Hyrcanus' mother wasn't true. It was a slanderous uh, thing. And um, he, notice it says in line 296, he made him leave the party of the Pharisees and abolish the decrees they had imposed on the people and punish those that observe them. So it seems like the Pharisees had been politically in charge and been involved in creating a le legislation, so to speak. And he says, from this source arose that hatred which he and his sons met with from the multitudes that because the Pharisees controlled the popular, uh, 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 you know, popular uh, uh, admiration, this caused Hyrcanus to be in conflict with the Pharisees. 
And, and notice what he says a little further down. What I now, would now explain is, Which line? this is line 297, is that the Pharisees have delivered to the people a great many observances by succession from their fathers. This is the oral law, which are not written in the laws of Moses. And for it is that reason that the Pharisees reject them and say we are Sadducees. Sadducees reject them and say that we are to esteem those observances to be obligatory, which are in the written word, but are not to observe that which are derived from the tradition of our fathers. So, and, and, and it talks about how the Sadducees are connected primarily with rich people, but the Pharisees, this is line 298, but the Pharisees have the multitude on this side. So, here it is that you begin to see what Josephus is claiming, and again, we have to take it with a certain grain of salt, that the Pharisees tend to be more of the masses and the Sadducees of the elite. And it was this kind of stuff that led uh, a scholar to, you know, essentially uh, have a kind of ne a Marxian approach to their understanding of the Pharisees. This was decades ago. So which sect did not believe that the that the oral law should be followed? The Sadducees, they were literal, they were text people only. Okay. Kind of like the Protestant ref reformers, right? <laughs> As opposed to the Catholics. There are times, Rabbi, when you take what he says as gospel, and there are times when you are disparaging about it. And I can't work out, other than your political agenda... It's not my political agenda. I am trying to be cautious. Remember, he's talking about something that's happening more than 200 years before his when he's writing. How much of this is in the sources he's using, and how much of this is Josephus? I can't answer that question, mm -hmm. okay? It's just an interesting picture that he says that soon after the emergence of the, Pharise of the whole sectarian phenomena in the time of Jonathan the high priest, um, fairly early on, you have this conflict between um, the Hasmonean dynasty and the Pharisees. And this gets played out in the next generation um, uh, during the time of Alexander Yanai, okay, um, where he has great conflict with the Pharisees during his lifetime. And when he dies, his widow, um, uh, Salome Alexa Alexandra, or in Hebrew she's known as Shlomo Tzion HaMalka, uh, um, she... Um, uh, she takes on a, a, a regency for her son, and she rules for a number of years quite well. Um, and But when her husband dies, on his deathbed he says, you'd better suck up, according to Josephus, you'd better suck up to the Pharisees, and if you do, they will, you know, give me a good eulogy, and you will be able to rule properly if you have them on your side. And that, those are the next two references in the list. One is from the Antiquities and one is from the Wars. Now, the one in the Antiquities is longer and much more positive about the political influence of the Pharisees on uh, Salome Alexandra. The one from the Wars, which is older, uh, less so. And what happens is, is that she decides to... Uh, it's hard to say, you know, it's, it, it, his description in makes it sometimes sound like basically she was their puppet, but um, having been persecuted under her husband, um, once she takes over and sort of allows them to, uh, to be sort of the ruling party, they take revenge on their enemies and kill about 800 of them. Okay, so here it is, they are ruling, they are uh, causing, you know, killing off their uh, political opponents. This is the um, Pharisees. The Pharisees, yes, these are the Pharisees. Um, and, and so it, it's quite fascinating how they appear to have this incredible political power at certain times in their history. Now, when you go down to the next reference, wi references, which are from the time of Herod, um, so, so we're now moving on lecture three, number two, B, B5, BV, okay. Um, the Antiquities of the Jews of uh, 15. Can um, I just ask you one question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, we're so used to following oral law, following rabbinic uh, yeah. responses. The, the fact is that the Torah really doesn't say very much. How can they just go by 
What's because the there was uh well be because they did. Because uh, they did. I, I mean <laughs> I, I mean uh, the the Karaites did that. Uh, I mean some people believe the Karaites actually are um, the spiritual descendants of the Sadducees. That some of the Sadducees didn't di that Sadducees didn't completely disappear with the destruction of the temple. And there's connections between the Karaites, um, uh, which you know arose in Babylon and you know in the early Middle Ages. Um, to the Sadducees. So they may have hung around a lot longer than we thought. Don't forget, the winners write the texts. Right, right. Okay, and there's not a lot about the Sadducees in rabbinic literature. Right, but but still, I mean, you read the Torah, and unless it's interpreted... Everybody you know, has to interpret it. You're right. right. It's all a question of how you interpret it, okay? <laughs> but the fact is, is that when you look at what the Karaites is an example of that, um, so um, it says, for example, you're not supposed to light a fire on Shabbat, so they don't put on any lights. What does this conversation have to do with Herod the Great? No, I haven't gotten there yet. He's asking about previously about the oral law. I'm still on the left. How do the Sadducees function with just the written Torah? The fact is they had their own interpretations, okay. I'm sure, but the the Pharisees there was this whole oral law that was developing, this mm -hmm. oral traditions that supplemented the written uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, the next time we see the Pharisees is during the time of Herod the Great. So let's let's take a look at because it's it's just a very brief thing. If you go to the to the um, the Antiquities, uh, ch uh, book fifteen, um, chapter one, paragraph one, uh, page uh, four seventy seven in our edition. Um, again, book fifteen, chapter one, paragraph one, line three. It mentions a guy named Polio. Mm. Um, when Herod um, uh, becomes king over Judea and all over, it mentions <laughs> that one of his chief advisors is a guy named Polio the Pharisee. And Polio is mentioned again in another reference. Okay? Um, what's interesting is, a little later on, in book 17, if you go to 17, book 17, chapter 2, um, page 544 in this edition, chapter 2, um, it's paragraph 4, but it's towards the end of paragraph 4, um, it's line 41, it starts off, there's a, a, a plot that's going on. Uh, Rabbi, please go back to that, to to the, the last thing on page 477. What? What was the take-home message you wanted to give us? One of Herod's chief advisors was a Pharisee named Polio, and he shows up in another text as well. So the fact is that one of Herod's, obviously he's he's got, you know, we don't know about the Pharisees as a group, but evidently there's still, a, uh, the Pharisees have a tremendous influence if one of Herod's chief advisors is specifically listed as a Pharisee. Okay, but then there's an in, there's a plot that's going on, and one of the things when you read the story of Herod's family, there's always plots going on, and Herod becomes incredibly paranoid about his children, and ends up you know you know he has several wives, gets rid of many of them, um, puts two of his sons to death. Anyway, this is something to do with one with his sister Salome, and um, she starts um, uh, 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 trying to. Um, uh, sort of egg on her brother, um, and um, no, it's actually I think she's a daughter. Anyway, the point is, um, and it's looking for number forty-one. It says, for there was a certain sect of men that were Jews who valued themselves highly upon the exact skill they had in the law of their fathers, and made men believe they were highly favored by God. These are those called the sect of the Pharisees who were in a capacity of greatly opposing things. Kings. Kings. A cunning sect they were and soon elevated to a pitch of open fighting and doing mischief. <laughs> Accordingly, when all the people of the Jews gave assurances of their goodwill to Caesar, that would be Augustus Caesar, and to the king's government, that's Herod's government, these very men did not swear, 
being above 6,000. This is the only time we actually have a number of how many Pharisees there are. So in the time of King Herod, Josephus is claiming there were 6,000 Pharisees. That's not a lot. He also in other places that there are 4,000 Essenes. And when the king imposed a fine upon them, uh, Fioria's wife paid their fine for them. Okay, so what happens is by the end of the chapter, uh, if you look up line 44, um, they get accused uh, and he puts to a bunch of them to death. And he says he also slew all those of his own family who had consented to what the Pharisees foretold. So you find... Again, because the Pharisees are not going to swear uh, allegiance, maybe because they didn't like taking oaths uh, to Augustus and to Herod in particular, he comes in conflict with them. They're a powerful a political group, and he persecutes them. So you have a ma major shift, or at least it seems like a major shift. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay? Now... Um, mm -hmm. There's another reference later on, after the death of Herod, where a Pharisee, uh, there, there is a revolt of a Galilean named Judas, and we will look at that um, because when we get to the fourth philosophy, one of the, this guy's right-hand men is a guy named Saduk, who is listed as a Pharisee, interestingly enough. The last one I want to point out, though, is in the Jewish wars, and this is you know, again, if the Jewish wars, because they were written closer to the events, is maybe more accurate or whatever, um, this is in Book 2 of the Jewish Wars, Chapter 17, um, and Paragraph 3, and it's on page 748, and it's line 411. So it's The Wars, 17, uh, uh, Book 2, Chapter 17, um, Paragraph 3. This is a very important chapter. We will come back to this. This is how the war, this was the actual outbreak of the war. What were the events that directly led to the outbreak of the war? So we don't want to go into that in detail, but there is a group that's trying to prevent it. So if you look at the beginning of paragraph 3, again, this is book 2, chapter 17, paragraph 3, line 411, it says... Um, what, it, what has just happened is, in the previous paragraph, is that one of the chief priestly officials has canceled the daily sacrifice in honor of the emperor. Now, uh, most other people in the Roman Empire venerated the emperor as a god and would sacrifice to the emperor. The Jews wouldn't do that, and they were exempt from doing that. But in the temple every day, they did a sacrifice in honor to God, to, you know, in honor of the emperor. So this priest, who was a high official, cancels the sacrifice to the emperor, and this is an act of rebellion. So then in paragraph 3, you have the reaction to it. It says, Hereupon the men of power got together and conferred with the high priests as did also the principle of the Pharisees, and thinking all was at stake, and so on and so forth. So a group of high, powerful officials, the laity, the priests, and the Pharisees, try to stop the rebellion. They're the peace party. <coughs> and that seems to be true. Were these, these priests were the Sadducees? He doesn't say. Right. They, they, they were priests. They're they not priests. all the priests were necessarily Sadducees. <laughs> no, the ones who canceled, canceled their, the sacrifice. Uh, no, it doesn't say that. The, sac the ones who canceled the sacrifice. No, it doesn't. It just says he was, a son, he was one of the sons of the high priests. Okay, so we don't know. The Sadducees are not mentioned here. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is, is that the original rebels were not the same as the rebels later on. When we studied the war in detail, you'll see how the rebellion got increasingly radical and the leadership of the rebellion got increasingly radical. But at the beginning, it was a large group of very disaffected people, which included uh, members of the family of the high priest and the and court officials, uh, I mean, the temple officials. Yes? 
Robert. Where, where is the bit about, and the, they were the peace party? Well, because 413? they... 413? Yeah, well, yeah, 413. They, they said they determined what they could do with the seditious by words, and they assemble the people. We don't, and we're not going into it now. But the point is they tried to stop the rebellion. All right? And there, in fact, there was an earlier uh, attempt by Herod Agrippa II um, to also calm things down. So the point is that this is the, in this chapter is showing how things begin to break down and in which the rebellion uh, really starts, okay? Because there's a tremendous amount of popular discontent against the procurator at the time. That's what really causes things to break out. What happens is, is once the revolt breaks out, it gets taken over by more radical factions so that there's no possibility of negotiations because the early part of the rebellion were basically people who were not angry at the emperor or the empire, but they were angry at the procurator. That's the Revolutionary War in a sense, the parliament, not the king. Yeah, exactly. And, and it was only because the radical factions began taking over that any possibility of concluding peace went out the window. Okay. In the years of gestation... We Where it, it, well, it, it was it, it was coming for a couple of decades, but this is really in the 60, 66 CE. That's when the war breaks out, and there have been some really bad problems with the procurator for for a couple of years. Okay, I mean we'll we'll talk we'll we'll get to that part. So here uh, the Pharisees appear to be an important part of the uh, ruling sort of the well respected establishment. Um, and they are part of the peace party. Okay. Um, we have basically um, uh, uh, looked, uh, uh, seen most of the reference to the Sadducees. There are very few references to the Sadducees. Um, oh, there's one in the Antiquities during uh, around 62 CE uh, under Albinus, the procurator, um, there is a high priest who is called a Sadducee, but he's the only one. That's specifically called a Sadducee. Now, when we look at the other references to the Essenes, this is quite interesting and worth a couple of looks at because every reference to the Essenes, um, uh, except for one um, where an Essene is listed as being part of the revolutionaries, that's um, number V, number five in the Jewish War, all the previous references that I've got listed here, the first four, are to um, three different Essenes who are seen as seers. So the first one is a guy named Judas who lives in the time of one of the um, uh, Hasmoneans, Jew uh, Judah Aristobulus, and there's two references to him, they're, they're the same one. So we don't have to look at both, but let's take a look at the first one. Uh, this is in the Antiquities Book 13. It's worth looking at because of, of the way it portrays this guy. Um, it's Book 13, Chapter 11, um, Paragraph 2, Page 427. Um, Aristobulus is one of the is the elder son of John Hyrcanus. Um, and so there's all these, you know, again, these uh, various plots about what happens after his father's death. He throws his mother into prison. Um, anyway, um, and uh, he's, he's got a brother um, named Antigonus. And um, the, the point is, it's all part of this plot. And if you turn over the page on 428 um, and um, uh, 311... Um, Suzanne, do you want to start reading? But here one may but okay. here one may take occasion to wonder at one Judas, who was of the sect of the Essenes, and who never missed the truth in his predictions. Okay, so this is around 103 BCE that we're talking about. And so there's this guy named Judas, who's an Essene, who is a well-known seer. Read on, for this man. For this man, when he saw Antigonus passing by the temple, cried to his companions and friends who abode with him as his scholars in order to learn the art of foretelling things to come. Notice Judas has got a group of disciples. He's the guru, the Rebbe, of a group who are attaching themselves to him. Just, you know, this is very typical. 
um, to learn how to become what he does. Go on. Uh, so he called out that it was good for him to die now, since he had spoken falsely about Antigonus, who is still alive, and I see him passing by, although he had foretold that he should die at the place called Strahos Tower that very day, while yet the place is 600 furlongs off where he had foretold he should be slain. And still this day is a great part of it already passed, so that he was in danger of proving a false prophet. As he was saying this, and that in a melancholy mood, the news came that Antigonus was slain in a place underground, which itself was called also Stratos Tower, or of the same name with that Caesarea, which is seated at the sea. This event put the prophet into a great disorder. Okay, so he, he was worried that his prophecy hadn't come to pass when in fact it had, but in a place of the same name, Stratos Tower. Okay, and, and there's another version of this exactly same story in the Jewish wars, okay? But then there's another guy during the time of Herod the Great, um, mentioned again both in the antiquities and in the wars, uh, basically the same incident. So let's take a look at the one uh, here. It's in book 15, uh, chapter 10. And this guy is named Menachem, and he's, he lives during the time of Herod. Um, so book 15, chapter 10. Um, par page, uh, paragraph 4, uh, page um, 506. But seer, that's not the same as, as prophet. Yeah, seer it is. is it's like a magician? No, no, it's a prophet. He's a prophet. a prophet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's doing prophetic stuff. And it's, it's line um, uh, 371, um, which is um, five, page 506. Um, and um, book, book 15, chapter 2, did you say? chapter 10, 10, 4, paragraph 4, line um, 370. Um, and so he talks a little bit, what's interesting is he talks a little bit about, uh, this is where polio is mentioned again, about taking an oath. Um, and um, uh, but then in 371, he begins talking about the, the Essenes. So, Suzanne, you want to pick it up there? The Essenes, also, as we call a sect of ours, were excused from this imposition. So, in other words, originally Philo, uh, uh, Herod had exempted the Pharisees because of polio, his close advisor, from taking this oath because they didn't like taking oaths, and neither did the Essenes. What Go on. What these, We're these, on 371. Yeah, what <clears throat> these men live the same kind of life as do those whom the Greeks call Pythagoreans. Intra so here's a place where he compares the Essenes to the yeah. Pythagoreans. Mm -hmm. Concerning whom I shall discourse more fully elsewhere. However, it is but fit to set down here the reasons wherefore Herod had these Essenes in such, in such honor, and thought higher of them than their mortal nature required. Nor will this account be unsuitable to the nature of this history, as it will show the opinion men had of these Essenes. Now there was one of these Essenes, whose name was Menachem, who had this testimony, that he, <clears throat> excuse me, that he not only conducted his life after an excellent manner, but had the foreknowledge of future events given him by God also. This man once saw Herod when he was a child and going to school and saluted him as king of the Jews. But he, thinking that either he did not know him or that he was in jest, put him in mind that he was but a private man. I think he means, but he, Herod. Yes. But Menachem smiled to himself and clapped him on his backside with his hand and said, However that be, thou wilt be king, and wilt begin thy reign happily, for God finds thee worthy of it. And do thou remember the blows that Menachem has given thee, as being a signal of the change of thy fortune. And truly this will be the best reasoning for thee, that thou love justice towards men, and piety towards God, and clemency toward thy citizens. Yet do I know how the whole conduct will, conduct will be, that thou wilt not be such a one. <laughs> For thou wilt excel all men in happiness, and obtain an everlasting reputation, but wilt forget piety and righteousness, and these crimes will not be concealed from God at the conclusion of thy life. 
when thou wilt find that he will be mindful of them and punish thee for them. So here is Menachem gives this prophecy, Whoa. you will be king and you will do great things, but because of your lack of piety, you're not gonna, your life isn't going to end very well. Go on. Now at that time, Herod did not at all attend to what Menachem said, as having no hopes of such advancement. But a little afterward, when he was so fortunate as to be advanced to the dignity of king, and was in the height of his dominion, he sent for Menachem and asked him how long he should reign. Menachem did not tell him the full length of his reign. Wherefore, upon that silence of his, he asked him further whether he should reign ten years or not. He replied, yes, twenty, nay, thirty years, but did not assign the just determinate limit of his reign. Herod was satisfied with these replies, and gave Menachem his hand and dismissed him. And from that time he continued to honor all the Essenes. Okay, so we can stop there. So, and this story is uh, first mentioned in the Jewish Wars, um, how this seer Menachem predicted the rise of Herod. And thereby Herod gave honor to the Essenes because of this favorable prediction. So, um, so, uh, and again, Menachem shows up again, as I said, in the Jewish wars during the time of Archelaus. Um, and then there's another seer mentioned, um, a guy named Simon. Um, and uh, as I said, they also mentioned as a member of uh, one of the Essenes as members of one of the revolutionary groups. So here in Josephus, after these long descriptions of the Essenes, he compares them to the Pythagoreans, or this monastic order, but the other primary description of them is a group of people who know how to tell the future. Um, and also, by the way, um, uh, do exorcisms. Uh, the, 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 it's mentioned somewhere as well. So um, uh, this, is, this is the, you know, so what's the picture? I mean, just to close this part. The picture is um, um, that if we were to, if we accept Josephus's historical account, the, the we have this emergence of the sectarian groups at the time of uh, Jonathan the high priest, which accords with other evidence we have, and from the group at Qumran, that there was sectarianism of a certain sort before this, but we don't really know anything about it. What we do know is there was a kind of sectarianism that emerges with the Hasmonean dynasty precisely because um, perhaps they, by, a, uh, by Jonathan taking the high priesthood, well, Simon had done it as well, um, there was a conflict between, you know, more traditionalists, you might say, but they appear, the, the sectarian groups appear primarily as political groups in Josephus. And this seems to be their chief characteristic down to the, uh, at least the Pharisees and the Sadducees do, um, as political groups down to um, the time of Herod, when they appear then more in a kind of, uh, the Pharisees in more of an advisory role. By the time of the wars, they are uh, part of the prominent uh, establishment, but they're not the only one. They, they don't seem to be ruling the roost as they do in the earlier accounts, um, so to speak. Um, the Essenes, uh, you know, are this monastic group, um, but have this capacity for getting involved with telling the future of rulers and things of that sort. The Sadducees seem to be connected to the wealthier classes, um, the priestly class, since one of the high priests is identified as a Sadducee, but they are consistently described as not having the same kind of influence as the Pharisees. Um, so that's our picture it's not completely consistent. Um, it changes. It seems to change. There's a certain difference between the wars, uh, the material in the Jewish wars as opposed to the antiquities. But, um, and, and because Josephus is one of our main sources for this whole thing, it's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to tell exactly what was going on. And why when you start looking at rabbinic literature, which is, of course, written down much later, and trying, because the Pharisees are mentioned in rabbinic literature and the Sadducees, the Essenes are not. The Essenes are not mentioned elsewhere. Um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and in the Book of Acts. It seems to me they lump them together, too. They actually don't. They're, they actually show a distinction. And, and, and the picture of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is 
similar to Josephus, but different in the New Testament. Of course, the New Testament literature is a very different kind of literature than Josephus. Mm -hmm. Very right. different kind of literature. So. Well, the Gospels are stories, uh, are accounts of the life and teachings of Jesus um, for particular Christian communities, and they're a kind of um, hagiography and midrash. They're not meant as historical accounts. They're religious accounts of because since Jesus is so important, the account of his life and his teachings is what's critical, not historical accuracy, we would say. In terms of historical accuracy, it strikes me that what Josephus is, is writing about, in, and it's probably more than in this book, it's so enormous. Yes. It's such a, a, a vast period of time, and in such great detail, it's hard to believe he could either know or remember all of this. Well, he doesn't. He's, he's using written sources, don't forget. He is, all the stuff that's before his own life, he's mm -hmm. getting it from written sources. Uh, you know... Uh, which uh, sites would have been lost. <clears throat> yeah, which he occasionally refers to and other ones he doesn't refer to, but that you can infer there's some Greek sources and Roman sources. He's obviously... I mean, he says during the Jewish wars, he's got the... The, the, you know, the accounts of the wars from Titus and, and Vespasian, their own personal written accounts of the campaigns, that he's using the, the imperial archives to make sure his account is correct. He's also, of course, when he gets to the time of his own life, he's relying on his own memories. He's probably, he, he has access to um, uh, um, uh, Agrippa, Herod Agrippa II, um, so he's got access to all this material, which I spoke about in the first lecture, that he's using. Uh, and um, he's got the Bible for the earliest parts. He's got the books of Maccabees. I mean, you know, but so he's, he's acting like any historian of his day. He's, he's not writing any differently than Tacitus and uh, Suetonius and Livy and all the Roman historians and Greek historians. Uh, I mean, don't forget, there's a good, strong tradition of writing histories, um, Herodotus, Thucydides, and he's building upon those models, which um, by the time of his life, there had been hundreds of years of Jews doing that kind of thing. Most of the material has been lost, but we know that there are other kinds of histories. I mean, he even says, this guy Justin wrote a history of the war, right? Did he write in... Language? Well, he wrote originally in Aramaic, um, and then it was translated into Greek, because his, his first edition of the wars was meant for the Jews of Babylon to warn them about, you know, what happened, to sort of tell them what happened. But it was translated into Greek and published in the Roman world in Greek. When, when did the Hasmonean dynasty start? Well, with the... Uh, with well, it started with uh, Jonathan. I mean, what, what, uh, well, it's what, the Maccabean revolt. It's the Maccabees. So Mac the, yeah, the, Maccabees? the more accurate is to call them the Hasmoneans, not the Maccabees. And don't forget, the term so Maccabee they, they was a Hasmonean. nickname was given to Judah. They were of a family of, of Asmodeus, uh, Has, the Hasmoneans. Mm -hmm. All right, that was their family. So that's why the descendants of Simon is the one who really begins the dynasty. Jonathan dies, and then Simon takes over, and it's really the descendants of Simon that are the subsequent Hasmonean rulers and kings. And they didn't call themselves kings at first. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they, um, you know, all the way, I mean, Herod married one of the one of the Hasmoneans, uh, one of his wives. But the point is that um, the Hasmoneans really ceased to have any ruling control after the Romans came in under Pompey in 63 BCE. Okay, refer back to the timeline for further <laughs> evidence. Okay, so now we're going to look at the what Josephus calls the fourth philosophy. Remember, he's talking about three groups. Now we're going to talk about the group he calls the fourth. And these he has numerous terms for. Brigands, insurgents, tyrants, sicarii, zealots... Okay, there's a couple others I didn't list. Uh, the point is, um, sometimes it's hard to tell whether he's talking about common thieves and, you know, robbers in the, on the roads and whether he's talking about revolutionaries. Because he can, uses the term brigand, um, which is lestes in, lestes in, uh, uh, in Greek. He refers to all kinds of people that way, and sometimes he'll refer to a group of zealots as lestes, and then zealots, and 
anyway, it, it's it's not always difficult. It's sometimes it's not always clear exactly. Um, again, whether he's talking about common robbers in the countryside or whether he's talking about actual revolutionaries. Could, could this be his reflection of how he thinks about? These well, he definitely <laughs> thinks the revolutionaries are robbers and brigands. Yes, right. I mean he 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 disparages them because by the time he's writing all this stuff, of course, uh, he is very much against. He 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 really. You know, he claims he was trying to stop the war, part of the group that tried to stop the war at the beginning, um, and he goes over to the Romans and he has to justify, as that will be our next topic after we finish with, with, the, sect, with the different groups, is his, full, his theology of history and how he understands why the Romans are ruling over the Jews. So let's take a look at his discussion <laughs> of the fourth philosophy, which is in the Antiquities, Book 18. This is just before that part where he talks about the sects. He starts, in fact, with the discussion of the four philosophies. This is Book 18, Chapter 1. Okay. And uh, Paragraph 1, where he talks about, um, and this is from uh, 6 CE. This is after the death of Herod. There is the outbreak of a major rebellion in the Galilee, which uh, this is on page. Uh, 571. Uh, the Galilee was a major source of uh, uh, rebe sort of rebellious groups during the time of Herod. Herod had to suppress various groups. So what we're talking about here is a time um, when Archelaus had been, who was Herod's son, um, had done such a poor job uh, ruling Judea. He was exiled by the emperor, and direct Roman rule had been applied to Judea and the Galilee, okay, and um, and what happens is is that um, uh, rebellion breaks out. So here is here we are. It starts um, with uh, line four, um, and uh, um, Jackie, do you want to do you want to start reading? You haven't read yet. 18, one, four. like, yeah, line four. Uh, Yet there was one Judas. Oh, there it is. Yet there was one Judas, a Galonite. Gal yeah, it means Galilean. Of a city whose name was Gamala. Gamla, uh, yeah. Gamla, yeah. Uh, who, taking with him Sadu, a Pharisee, became zealous to draw them to a revolt, who both said that this taxation was no better than an introduction to slavery and exhort exhorted the nation to assert their liberty, as if they could procure that them happiness and security for what they possessed, and an assured enjoyment of a still greater good, which was that of the honor and glory they would thereby acquire for magnanimity. So there's a tax problem. It's a tax revolt. Okay? Against the authorities. Go on. They also said... Uh, they also said that God would not otherwise be assisting to them than upon their joining with one another in such councils as might be successful and for their own advantage and is especially. If they would set about great exploits and not grow weary in executing the same. Okay, so uh, Josephus is claiming that they did this in fact for their own self-aggrandization and their own <clears throat> self-wealth. Uh, uh, in other words, he's, he's giving... He's attributing to them base motives, but he's also, the point out he's saying is, is that to accept this taxation is to become <laughs> slaves, and also that God would be on their side in this revolt against the authorities. All right, now, um, read on. So men received. So men received what they said was with pleasure, and this bold, bold attempt proceeded to a great height. Tax revolts are always a, mm -hmm. uh, always a, a popular, as we know in our own day, right? And the consequences of that revolt are often not thought about. Go on. All sorts all, of misfortunes. All sorts of misfortunes also sprang from these men, and the nation was infected with this doctrine to an incredible degree. One violent war came upon us after another, and we lost our friends, who used to alleviate our pains. There were also very great robberies and murders of our principal men. So he traces all of the misfortunes that subsequently happen, the various revolts and murders and various all kinds of things, from this time of this guy, Judas, 
from Gamla in the Galilee. In other words, he's tracing the roots of the rebellion back 60 years. Yes, Irma. Yeah, no, so this is the same time or before that business in the temple where the priests... No, this is 60 years before. Before that. Yeah, this is the time of uh, Archelaus. This is, this is before the procurators are brought... This is around the time when... The, this is when the procurators are brought in. Mm -hmm. Okay? Approximately what year? 6 CE. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, read on. This was done. This was done in pretense, indeed, for the public welfare, but in reality for the hopes of gain to themselves. Whence arose seditions, and from them murders of men, which sometimes fell on those of their own people, by the madness of these men towards one another, while their desire was that none of the adverse party might be left, and sometimes on their enemies. A famine also coming upon us reduced us to the last degree of despair, as a did also the taking and demolishing of cities. Nay, the sedition at last increased so high that the very temple of God was burnt down by their enemies. Fire. Again, he's tracing the destruction of the temple back 60 years. And he talks about how these groups uh, are going to murder fellow Jews, fight amongst themselves, cause the destruction of the cities. And so he, in effect, is blaming uh, Judas the, the Galilean for the origin of everything that happens now. Is that true? Maybe, maybe not. Because there are periods between 6 and 66 where there are times when things are pretty quiet. It's not one constant set of rebellions. In fact, there's little outbreaks here and there, um, but it's only later on, um, after the 40s, that things really begin to break down. Uh, and in fact, most of what happens before then is relatively localized. Now, there is this particular point where there is an outbreak that has been called Varus's War because the Roman commander was a guy named Varus, um, which was particularly severe at this moment. But it was a critical junction, don't forget, where it was going from what we might call Jewish self-rule to Roman direct rule. Okay, um, and he says that's um, were the consequences of this. Um, now, uh, uh, skip to the next page, and, and he says um, all this, he basically blames this Judas and Sadok. And so, Jackie, pick it up. It says, who excited a fourth philosophic. Who excited a fourth philosophic sect among us and had a great many followers therein filled their civil government with tumults at present and laid the foundation of our future miseries by this system of philosophy, which we were before unacquainted with, acquainted with all, concerning which I shall discourse a little, and this is the rather because the infection which spread thence among the younger sort who were zealous for it brought the public to destruction. So he then does his description, which we've read before, of the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes. But then take a look on page 573, paragraph 6, where he's going to now directly talk about the fourth philosophy. Mm -hmm. Muriel, do you want to pick it up at that point? You see line 23. Yeah. But the fourth set of the but, fourth... But of the fourth sect of Jewish philosophy, Judas the Galilean was the author. These men agree in all other things with the Pharisaic, Pharisaic. Pharisaic uh, notions, but they have an invaluable attachment to liberty. And they say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. Now, this is important. They're like the Pharisees generally in practice, but unlike the Pharisees who are willing to submit to a certain extent to the ruling authority, although they will not take an oath of allegiance, um, these guys say that God is the ruler, therefore no human can be a ruler over us. Avinu malkenu ein melech ela ata. Our father, our king, we have no king but you. That can be seen as a seditious statement. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate result of radical monotheism. Radical monotheism, in effect, says... There can be no rule, earthly ruler to which you should owe allegiance. It's one of the kind of underlying things which undermines the whole notion of monarchy, even back in the time of the kings of Judah and Israel. 
If God is king, then the earthly kings at most can be, you know, the agents of God, although the Davidic dynasty tried to, you know, up the go it up. So it negates the divine right of kings. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and in fact, I will claim that the divine right of kings is not a biblical idea. Because only the Davidic line is given that. No other earthly king or dynasty is given that. It's probably one of the reasons why the British monarchy wanted to, to claim its descent from mm -hmm. King David. But anyway, um, read on. They, do also, they also do not... do not value dying any kind of death, nor indeed do they heed the deaths of their relations and friends, nor can any such fear make them call any man lord. See that? They're against martyrdom. They're no, they're in favor of martyrdom. They do not heed any the deaths of And that meaning they don't care. So in other words, they're willing to die for what they believe. Go on. And since this immovable resolution of theirs is well known to a great many, I shall speak no farther about that matter, nor am I afraid that anything I have said of them shall be disbelieved, but rather fear that what I have said is beneath the resolution they show when they undergo pain. In other words, he says, I'm not telling you uh, enough about how far they're willing to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was Gessius Floristan. In Gessius, Gessius Floristan. Floristan. That's the procurator when things really started to, mm -hmm. in the 60s, go on, that this time, nation... That, that the nation began to grow mad with this distemper. Who was our procur procurator? And who occasioned the Jews to go wild with it by the abuse of his authority and to make them revolt from the Romans. And these are the sects of Jewish philosophy. Florus was such a bad pro procurator, as we will see, that it was really his, he caused the outbreak of the rebellion but and allowed this fourth philosophy to flourish. Okay? Okay, so looking, um, we're not going to look at all the references, but if you look at the list that I gave you, so again, the use of the term lestes, brigands, is widespread in Josephus. The translation we're using often translates it as thieves and robbers. The problem is that brigands is more ambiguous um, and therefore shows you how it can be applied to uh, revolutionaries and real thieves and robbers. But he talks about a number of them, and um, in fact, uh, one of them, um, and, and by the way, what's interesting is, is that he actually suggests that some of the leaders of the subsequent um, minor revolts that occur in the decades following the death of Judas the Galilean are, in fact, his descendants. It's a family business, so to speak. Um, what's interesting is he sometimes uses a term uh, meaning a brigand chief, not just a lestes, but an archilestes, okay, a chief brigand. One of the more interesting terms he, he does, if you turn over on page two of that material, is the use of the term Sicarii. The assassins, that's what I read. What? Assassins. Well, it's an interesting word. It's a Greek word that actually comes from a Latin word, Sicarius, uh, an assassin. In Yes, in, um, in Latin it means an assassin, and it comes from the root of the word of a knife because they carried little sickle-shaped little knives. And according to Josephus, they start arising in the late 50s, early 60s. So let's take a look at that. This is on page 736 in this edition of The Wars. It's chapter, it's book two, chapter 13. Um, Jewish Wars, Jewish Wars chap, uh, Book 2, Chapter 13. Um, it's on page 736 in this edition. Uh, and what he's talking about, first of all, is he's talking about what happens um, after um, uh, uh, the death of Herod Agrippa I. Um, and, um, and then what happens is uh, when... Uh, they another the pure like Herod Agrippa ruled for a few years again as a Jewish king, essentially in his grandfather's territory. He was the grandson of Herod the Great. He basically got all the old territories back. He only ruled for a few years. This was during Claudius's reign as emperor. Uh, Herod Agrippa uh, died, um, uh, 
and the it went back to what it was before, where there was a pure procurator, and it was a guy named Felix. Okay, and if you look at line 253, um, and it talks about the fact that he took this guy, Eleazar, the arch robber, <laughs> um, and... Um, but again, arch brigand. But then in 254, line 254, paragraph 3, he begins to, he says, once the brigands were sort of suppressed under Felix, we have a new phenomenon. Irma, do you want to start reading there, when the country was purged? When the country was purged of these, there sprang up another sort of robbers in Jerusalem, which were called Sakarii, who slew men in the daytime and in the midst of the city. This they did chiefly at the festivals, when they mingled themselves among the multitude and concealed daggers under their garments with which they stabbed those that were their enemies. And when any fell down, the murderers became a part of those that had indignation against them, by which means they appeared persons of such reputation that they could by no means be discovered. It's a rather clever strategy. They come up with their knives in a crowded at the, the at the Hagim and stab the guy and then say, oh my God, look what's going on, you know. Um, but notice who they go on. The first man, this is really interesting. The first man who was slain by them was Jonathan the high priest, after whose death many were slain every day, while the fear men were in of being so served was more afflicting than the calamity itself. And while everybody expected death every hour, as men do in war, so men were obliged to look before them and to take notice of their enemies at a great distance. Nor, if their friends were coming to them, durst they dare trust them any longer. But in the midst of their suspicions and guarding of themselves, they were slain. Mm. Such was the celebrity of the plotters against them, and so cunning was their contrivance. So the Sakarii create such fear yeah. that um, people are, don't know who to trust. Okay, but they didn't really have a major impact. I mean, they killed the high priest, Jonathan, and we know that was around 59 CE. Um, interestingly enough, there's another account of Jonathan's assassination in the Jewish wars where it, uh, he claims that, in fact, it was the procurator Felix who, who contrived in the uh, death of, John, of Jonathan. Okay, but here he's blaming the Sicarii. The Sicarii show up during the revolution um, and um, as a group, as a distinct group of the revolutionaries, what they, they do in, in around 68 to 69, um, they ally themselves with a group of Idumean revolutionaries, but then they fall out with them. So that's the next major mention of them, is 68, 69, during the revolt in the Jewish wars. Um, uh, sorry, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I skipped something. No, the, the, they don't show up again until 67, mm -hmm. where they, they take over Masada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the revolutionaries who were at Masada were Sakarii, who left Jerusalem, were not participating in the rest of the war, spent the entire war at Masada, and when you read the account, they were in fact attacking villages around Masada for supplies. In other words, they were attacking their fellow Jews. So they don't appear, I mean, Josephus didn't like them at all, so they don't appear as sort of heroes or anything, and they're the ones, of course, who make the last stand at Masada. They're all Sicarii, according to Josephus. Yes, Robert? How do these people fit in with the Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes? They Josephus puts them as part of the fourth philosophy. In other words, so they're none of the three. They're right? none of the they three. Um, he, he 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 in effect says there's a whole other group of people who are these revolutionaries, who he calls various names. Right, brigand. He puts the Sicarii. Eventually, he's going to talk about the zealots. They don't show up till later. But um, the first person they assassinate was Jonathan, who you have said to us was responsible. No, that's the an earlier Jonathan. Oh. <laughs> Jonathan is a very common name. This is Jonathan. I made it very clear. This is Jonathan the high priest who in 59 CE, not Jonathan the high priest 140 BCE. This is keep your keep your chronology straight. This is 200 years later. It's a different Jonathan. Hey, look, there's a lot of names that keep getting shown up all over the place, uh, Jesus being one of them, by the way. Yeah. Judas. I mean, there's just, you know, 
okay. common Jewish names at the time. The point is, the Sicarii, are they connected mm -hmm. to this earlier group from Judas the Galilean? Are they a new group? We, we don't know. Uh, they seem to be a new phenomenon, an urban group of assassins mm -hmm. who are trying to, well, they're terrorists. I mean, that's the, let's face it. The people who took the last stand at Masada by our terms today are nothing but terrorists. Okay? And they mostly killed their own people. And they weren't brave enough or whatever. They didn't join with the rest of the revolutionaries at Jerusalem to defend themselves against the Romans. They went and hid out at Masada and plundered their own people's uh, property. Uh, again, we're, this is all from Josephus' perspective. And in the end, they took a last stand, according to Josephus, and they killed themselves. But in fact, they, we don't even know whether they actually did kill themselves. From the archaeological evidence, it's quite unclear. Did, did you tell us that this, that this what happened at Masada might have been a fiction, and what happened with, with Josephus? Yeah, the, the, the Sicarii, the Masada may not have killed themselves. That was something that, because Josephus wasn't there, he may have re, he reconstructed everything there from other accounts, and he may have invented the, 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 the suicide pact. That, ma that matched what, what happened to him, through. exactly. Yeah. And exactly. This Felix, is this the same Felix that Paul dealt with? When he went, um, when he was... I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, prob uh, probably not. But the, the Felix was a common Roman name. Okay. Uh, um, the, the, the point is, that's the Sicarii. Um, next week, we'll, we'll, we'll stop, start with the Zealots. Again, they're the last group we're going to uh, mention of this group. And then we'll briefly look... Uh, we're not going to really look at the Samaritans. I'll, I'll just briefly mention them. And then we'll look at the three accounts of the Christians that we have in Josephus. Um, and then we'll move on to the material I gave you last time, which is uh, Josephus' theology of history. Once we're finished this, we'll get to the actual uh, outbreak of the war. And we can't read all the accounts of the war. It's far too complicated. Um, if you feel like reading it, um, it starts in, you know, the war proper starts um, in uh, book two of, uh, of the wars. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you want to, um, uh, it's in where, where we saw it before. The point is, um, it, it, it's, um, it's pretty, you know, pretty bloody account. A lot of it is about, um, as you'll see, about how the revolutionary groups end up fighting amongst themselves primarily. Um, but we'll chart the general course of the war uh, in, the, in the lectures that remain once we've dealt with these other two issues. Names. Yes. You say many names recur. Yeah. Did the name David ever recur? Did people not use that name? You know, that's really interesting. I don't think so. I don't remember ever seeing the name David. I, I mean, but, mm -hmm. you know, there are you know, there are fads and names. Like Hyrcanus became a very common name amongst the Jews. And even there's rabbi, a rabbi's families, mm -hmm. uh, somebody was named Hyrcanus. Um, but you get names like uh, Jesus, which is a form of Joshua. You get Jonathan. You get mm -hmm. Simon. You get um, uh, uh, Greek names, not just like mm -hmm. Hyrcanus, but Antigonus. You know, th things of that sort. Yeah. I don't recall ever seeing David again. No, I, I think you're right. <laughs>